I think that the Dora was. I think the Dora was, like most people, intimidated by him. He had to be pretty strong to stay around him long because he was extremely competitive. And he couldn't stand two things. He couldn't stand if you were mediocre, and if you were good, then it, that, was not, that was even worse. Picasso persuaded her that what she really needed was to have a child with him, to make her less intellectual, he said, more in touch with nature. On May 15, 1947, their son Claude was born. Picasso was amused to find that his son had a strong personality like his, and the father wasn't the only one who enjoyed inciting jealousy. We went to visit Matisse, and uh, I would come back very impressed and I would say, ah, oh, you know, my father, to my father and my mother, I say, ah, oh, you know, Matisse, you know, he's a real painter. And my father would say, what about me? Oh, no, 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 it's not the same, you know, not the same thing at all. You know, you just, uh, you, you just go and play with your things. But this is, you can see, he's a real painter. So my father would go off the wall. Picasso loved the energy young children brought to his life. But as they got older, he grew critical and intolerant particularly with his firstborn, Paolo. I remember on one occasion at Valeris when Paolo was sitting on the table after lunch and there were other people there and Picasso pointed to Paolo and said, isn't it terrible for a man like me to have a son like that? Terrible thing to say. In 1947, Picasso discovered the old ceramic-producing town of Valoris in the hills above Antibes. Instantly, he was full of ideas he wanted to try in pottery. Valoris also had another attraction. It was a Communist Party stronghold. In 1948, he and Francoise bought a house here. Valoris felt like home to Picasso, and the townspeople loved him. We had a great deal of fun. Picasso used to tell me, Arias, a day without laughing is a wasted day. Picasso's studio swarmed with visitors. He devoured the attention by day and used it in his work by night. You'd find at the end of the day, you'd had a very good time, uh, it was all very relaxed, but she was suffering from nervous exhaustion. Why? Because he had got the energy out of every single person. He'd, he was like a vampire in that way. Picasso was now an international superstar, a celebrity on a scale that no other painter in history had ever achieved. The Communist Party was well aware of the boost he could bring to their Cold War propaganda. In January of 1949, he created the symbol for the international peace movement, executed in lithograph, the dove. I am in England, he said, for the second time for the Peace Congress, and I hope for success for this uh, magnificent cause. Picasso hated to travel, but in 1948, he boarded a plane for the first time and attended several communist-sponsored peace conferences. The following year, in 1949, Pablo and Francoise's second child was born, and they named her after the Spanish word for dove, Paloma. As the demands on Picasso's time grew, Francoise found herself shouldering the burden of his celebrity behind the scenes maintaining the studio and taking care of their children. Picasso was continually attracting new admirers, but if they got close to him, they were bound to see another side of him, as Francoise eventually did. He could be the most charming person you, you might. Otherwise, why would he have charmed so many people? So he was extremely charming, and then when he had charmed you thoroughly, then he would become nasty once in a while, or not so much nasty as cruel. Picasso, nearing 70, showed no signs of mellowing with age. To the contrary, the summer of 1951, just two years after Paloma was born, he began a short-lived affair with a young woman, Genevieve Laporte, who was 23 years old. 
Francoise learned of the affair and told Picasso she was leaving. A large part of Picasso was still rooted in the 19th century Spain of his birth, and he wanted to have both women, as he'd always done. But Francoise wouldn't stand for it. He did not believe I would do it. Because he said, no one leaves a man like me. I said, you wait and see. But of course, after I left, he was extremely furious and kind of uh, waged war on me for the rest of uh, his life. <laughs> In September 1953, Francoise took the children and walked out for good. It was the first time a woman had left Picasso. He was stunned and hated being left with her ghost in the house. Characteristically, he tried to paint her out of his system in this 1953 canvas. I think that psychologically it's interesting. It shows my mother sort of hovering over Paloma and I, and I'm writing or designing something on a white page, which is the future, and the mother is above the children, you know, sort of worrying about the future. This is about the time when my mother uh, uh, left him, and we all went, and he probably was wondering what would the future be. In the end, Picasso was very isolated because he had done it himself, so to speak. He had an aspect of, of himself who could be self-destructive. Because sometimes he was destructive, meaning to be destructive of others, but in, in the end he was destructive of himself. Picasso was terrified of being alone, terrified of death, and terrified of losing his power as a painter. But giving in to any one of them was something his colossal ego just could not permit. He labored on with an intensity that would have exhausted men half his age. In 1953, the Soviet leader, Joseph Stalin, died, bringing to an end three decades of totalitarian rule. The Communist Party in France published a drawing by Picasso of Stalin for his obituary in their newspaper. Picasso's drawing ignited a controversy inside the party and out. Stalin loyalists were unhappy that it didn't glorify their hero enough. But to non-communists, it seemed bizarre that the man who painted Guernica could appear to be indifferent to the terror and brutality of Stalin's rule. He was certainly not totally ignorant of what was going on behind the Iron Curtain. To his end, it seems that he was sticking to the party, he defended it whenever he could, and he never, ever publicly denounced it or criticized it in any way. Picasso didn't publicly budge from his position, but the controversy left him bewildered, and it came at one of the darkest times in his life. Francoise was gone and he hated living alone in the house they had shared, surrounded by his own portraits of her. The winter of 1953, 1954 was very hard on Picasso. He was lonely in his little house. You could have said that uh, he could have gone to a hotel, but no, he lived alone. Those were very difficult times. It wasn't long before a woman appeared to fill the vacancy Francoise left. Jacqueline Roque was 27 and worked in the pottery at Valoris. Picasso was struck by her resemblance to a painting by the 19th century romantic master Eugene Delacroix, the woman of Algiers. He made 15 paintings of his newest lover as Delacroix's harem beauty. Jacqueline moved in and offered Picasso her nearly slavish devotion that at the same time gave her almost complete control of his life. What Jacqueline had to offer my father was completely different than Francoise, than Dora Mar, than my mother, than Olga. She was very submissive, always calling him Monsignor. Monseigneur. Just imagine, I would start laughing every time she called him sir, because I thought it was very funny. Jacqueline was a paradox. She was very submissive, very obedient, and very self-effacing at first. But my goodness, she changed, and she really took over. Jacqueline's devotion to Picasso meant he was free to work. 
and work he did at an astonishing pace. Again, he had a source of youth to feed his art and to fend off the fearful consciousness of his advancing years. If Picasso had not kept creating, he would have felt old. To create was to feel alive. It was a way of fighting old age, creating more and more. He worked incessantly, sort of like a struggle against death. This was obvious. On November 3rd, 1954, his most respected rival and friend, Henri Matisse, died. The news sent a shudder through Picasso, a chilling reminder of his own mortality. He didn't want to hear about death. He said.